Hello everyone and welcome back to Sandbox EDB and Kerbal Space Program 1.0.5. Today the EDB has decided to revive its old asymmetric aircraft program with this design, the ASIM-2. This is just an in-atmosphere proof of concept test for the craft and it doesn't have enough fuel to make orbit. The goal of this design is to be able to launch a substantial number of tourists to orbit but at the same time carry up to 7 tons of a substantially hazardous cargo, possibly a probe with a nuclear engine for example. And you can see a lot of the asymmetries involved. The vertical stabilizers are tilted in different directions. The outer wing tips are tilted slightly different. And of course the wing profile itself is not quite the same. The engines are, have, are thrust limited so that the left pair are at 100% but the right pair are at 86 to 87%. And uh, yeah, we will see how this works. It is quite, a, quite an interesting design. Air brakes are now off and engines are ready to go. The pilot for this test flight is Dan Lee Kerman and with him is scientist Tom Kerman who is the chief investigator on a probe that may be launched by the ASIM-2 so he wants to experience the stability or lack thereof of the craft firsthand. A very courageous scientist that Tom Ger. Uh, here we go. The rapiers are lit. And the ASIM-2 getting up to speed here. With its huge wing, it shouldn't take too much velocity to get off the ground. And here we have rotation and lift off. So we'll see, we'll keep an eye on the roll yaw and pitch indicators to see if there is any apparent instability in the craft, especially as it turns, makes maneuvers, and uh, loses fuel. As it depletes fuel, of course, its center mass will change. Uh, uh, more back to front than left to right. Uh, it is configured so that uh, it is symmetrical on the left to right axis somewhat. Uh, the center mass actually lies closer to the body that is populated with kerbals uh, and away from the cargo side. So the cargo side is actually lighter than the, than the passenger side. So here we have some basic maneuvers and it seems to be maneuvering just fine. Nice large vertical stabilizers, of course, with the EDB logo. Control seems all right. Uh, test of stall speeds seems quite maneuverable. Handling quite well, but uh, now we have to see it back in in stable flight to really verify that it hasn't been thrown off by anything just yet. Natalie is going to turn it towards the island runway here and we'll have a flyby of that runway. We are not going to attempt to touch down though. Considering that this aircraft should be able to get to fairly low stall speeds, as long as it approaches the runway at a low speed, it should be able to touch down on a fairly short runway. It does have the air brakes. It does not have any drag chutes though. Okay. Taking a look at those indicators, they're well within bounds at least. It's a fine turn there. After flying over the Allen runway, the ASIM-2 will proceed to high velocity testing with high velocity maneuverability past the speed of sound and uh, attempting to reach Mach 4 at high altitude though uh, not beyond 20 kilometers. Here we see uh, basic glide testing and I don't think it's possible for the ASIM-2 to get to that runway just like that, gliding, so uh, we do have a little bit more engine power though the plan is for the plane to glide over the runway on its pass. We'll see how stable it is when it does that. Okay, approaching the island runway now. And you see uh, SAS off now for this test. And there is a little bit of a wiggle. Uh, yaw control is being used to try and line up with the runway. It's, uh, the plane is a little bit off and a little bit high compared to normal occasions where we do a flyby of the island runway during tests. The start out a little bit high. But even without SAS, it seems relatively stable. Okay, now gaining altitude again. Danley seems to be quite confident in the aircraft's performance so far and engines are ignited again. 
So now on to uh, high speed testing as it gains altitude. It will attempt to break the speed of sound at around 10 kilometers, so it needs to gain some height before that. Here we are proceeding eastward from the island runway and continuing to gain altitude. Fairly slowly though, considering the large wing. Now at 200 meters per second, 4.5 kilometers in altitude. We are just shy of 10 kilometers and we are well past the speed of sound now, Mach 1.3 and gaining. And at around Mach 1.5, we will begin maneuverability testing. Here we go. The aircraft is turning now at 12 kilometers. Losing a bit of speed as it turns. Very, very difficult to turn at this velocity considering the huge wing and the sort of inertia that it creates. Continuing to turn around back to the KSC here. We will, of course, attempt to land back at the runway. Okay, the ASM-2 has completed its turn towards the KSC now, and it is still above the speed of sound, and gaining it is going to attempt to approach Mach 3.7, which is the ideal velocity for the rapier engines, where they get their max thrust. Now at 13 kilometers above Mach 2, Closing in on the KSC just south so that when it turns around it can line up with the runway. 13 kilometers altitude. We're now past Mach 3. And there is some instability in the nose there. Some pitch variations. Possible, possibly if SAS was turned off, uh, that, uh, that wiggle there would not be present. Almost 16 kilometers altitude. Now above 1,100 meters per second. Generally, it's not expected that this plane will be going this fast at this altitude. Closing in on 1,200. We're at 1,200 meters per second, 16.2 kilometers. And mission control is satisfied with that, so, so we have a throttle down, and it's got to take some time for this craft to slow down. There was overheating in the cockpit, but it's not expected to go at 1200 meters per second at this altitude anyway. It would normally break that at above 20 kilometers. So now the slow descent and slow down. Again, lots of inertia with this craft. And so it's gonna take some time even once the air brakes are deployed. And we do see air brakes deployed here, 15 kilometers altitude. Still going more than 700 meters per second above Mach 2.5. Beginning to try to turn around here at Mach 2.5, but uh, turning is very slow. Even with engines, uh, turning isn't uh, happening very easily here, just above the speed of sound, what Mach 1.2. The thinner air means that maneuverability is reduced. Here we're descending down to where it initially did its uh, Mach 1.5 maneuverability testing, and so it's turning at close to the same rate though we do have a lot less liquid fuel and so the balance is quite different. Continuing to turn the mountain range, the western mountain range right there. Relatively level in terms of altitude as we turn. Seems well controlled. Um, ignore the yaw, that's just uh, piloting piloting curiosity. As we return to level flight we expect the yaw to be centered. Well, if, if the pilot manages to get back to low flight. Okay, descending. There is a slight residual yaw there. Very little liquid fuel left. Lots of oxidizer because, of course, that wasn't used during this test. Uh, the fact that there is so much oxidizer might be an issue in terms of deciding whether this is really a legitimate test considering... Uh, re-entry profiles and all of that where most of the oxidizer would be depleted. Also there is still the payload in the cargo bay. There is a locked uh, 4.5 ton tank and 2.25 ton tank uh, summing to 6.75 tons in the cargo bay and uh, that would normally be deployed before re-entry. Okay we have gear out and air brakes out lined up with runway one kilometer altitude. 
Okay, approach to runway is good, 300 meters above sea level, 200 meters above runway altitude. Coming down pretty well here, still pretty fast, 100 meters per second and decelerating. 100 meters altitude, 50 meters. Thirty meters, ten, touchdown. Ooh, quite a lot of flex on the whole structure there, but uh, touchdown is successful, and we are seeing some breaking. Will this have any of the issues that the that the Aquarius SSTO had with uh, flopping on its tail? We certainly hope not. Okay, coming to a stop here, and as it comes to a stop, it seems to be tending to the right side here, skidding a little bit there, perhaps because of the weird configuration of the landing gear. And we checked the fuel situation, those are the locked tanks in the cargo bay. We see the huge amount of residual oxidizer, which means that maybe this test is not sufficient for deciding whether this will really be stable on landing, but for now we can say that the test of the ASIN-2 is successful. Uh, certainly Dan Lee Kerman and Tom Kerman have done their job. Tom Ger uh, expressed satisfaction concerning the craft and so we may see a probe launched by it soon. However, more fuel will have to be added to this in order to allow it to get to orbit and possibly that will be on the tail where nose cones are currently on those uh, air brake pods if you will, the ones that have the intake then fuel tanks then nose cones. Yeah, that was one suggestion but we could sneak some fuel on in other locations and designers will just have to take a look at that. Possibly drop tanks on the center portion of the wing is also an option. Uh, it does not need to be an SSTO after all. Uh, it could be that it actually drops off fuel tanks on the way up. So many configurations are possible for the ASIN-2. It is currently just an interesting curiosity that it worked and the EDB is quite happy with that. So. On that note, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we will see you next time.